the first of two, Lord willing. Two lessons on something maybe you haven't heard about. Um, there's not a lot of resources out there on this, but I am happy to bring it to you. I call it the biblical theology of fun. So since that's been in the bulletin and people have heard I'm going to be talking about this, I've, I've fielded a lot of questions. What is a theology of fun? Why are we, why are we talking about this? So first, I, I feel like it would be helpful to define what I mean by, by fun. Uh, fun, sort of shorthand for the enjoyment of or taking pleasure in experiences, sensations, people, or things in life. Hopefully every day by that definition, you have lots of opportunity to have fun. It's enjoyable, right? Built into the definition, we, we like to have fun. Fun is enjoyable. It's something we like to do. In some senses, we live in a world that is dominated by a pursuit, an idolatry of fun. And so why a theology of fun? Well, because fun must be viewed in proper relationship to God. So over the years, it's been teaching in student ministries. I love student ministries because the kids just ask questions. Like, is it okay to have fun? Like that's something that, I don't know, it, I don't get asked often by, by adults, but junior hires, high schoolers who are facing the question of, what does it mean to be a Christian? I see the world living for fun, sinning in their pursuit of fun. Really, everything that they call fun is really just a mask for God rejection and lustful pleasure seeking. And they, they look at the Bible and the call to live for the glory of God. Uh, wartime mentality, the reality that we are aliens and strangers here, that we are not of this world. We've been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. We aren't living for this world and its pleasures. We've been crucified with Christ, so we're not living anymore. It's Christ who lives in us. So is it okay for us to have fun? And I've spoken with newer believers on fire believers, believers who are committing their lives to Christ, taking weekends, even weekdays, going out and evangelizing strangers, evangelizing their neighbors, living for Christ. And when I've invited them to have fun, hey, you want to come over and play a game? Let's go on a hike. Let's go on a walk and enjoy the sunrise. You get a funny look in, in their eyes and, and they're like, why, why would I do that? I don't have time for fun. This world is passing away. There's people out there who are dying without Christ. I have to go preach the gospel. And there's something really good in that. I, I want to sacrifice my pursuit of fun. I want to sacrifice my own joy for the benefit of others. That, that's actually what Jesus did for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, but even, even in that suffering, there was joy. He was pursuing a, a greater joy, a selfless joy. There's, there's something really good, though, in that impulse of, I don't want to live for fun because that's what I used to live for, right? The, the world is dead set on pursuing pleasure and fun as ultimate. Right? The, the world lives for fun. Just get through Monday through Friday so I can have the weekend because that's when the fun starts. Um, this world is all that they hope in. It's all that they know. They want to pack in as much fun as they can, work hard so they can retire and have as much fun as possible before they die. 
And we all lived there. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. Can you open up your Bible to Ephesians 2, chapter 1? I, it's understandable why somebody would question, can we have fun? Because the, uh, the life that they used to walk in was dominated by fun as an idol. Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once walked. You formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among whom we all formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Do you see what this is saying? We all were Christians. We all at one time were not Christians, just like the rest. And how did we conduct ourselves? according to the lusts of the flesh. Really, we just said, my body wants to do it. My mind wants to do it. And when we consulted with ourselves, we said, will that, will that thing provide maximal joy? And if so, yes, I will pursue it. The, the problem was we were setting our, our target of joy far too low, right? We were replacing what was supposed to point us to the creator as the ultimate satisfaction. And we were seeking satisfaction in the gifts. I will get there later. But, but when you realize that's what I used to live for, I used to live for fun and it, it didn't satisfy. God's called me to something greater. I used to live for this world as if the world is ultimate and God changed my perspective. So I see this world for what it is a small, significant blip before eternity with the Lord or under his judgment. How could I live for the things in this world? How could I live for, for fun? Don't live for fun. But that doesn't mean you can't have it. Smedley, if you remember from his summary of Ecclesiastes said, and this will be the third point that Lord willing we will get to next week, only Christians can have fun. Only Christians can be rightly related to fun because only Christians are rightly related to their Lord. And the reason why we can have fun in an ultimate real sense in a way that might actually bring pleasure that does, doesn't evaporate is because we are rightly related to our Lord. The world wastes their lives living for pleasure, endlessly going after the next dopamine hit. The weight of glory of God is exchanged for like lightweight celebrity gossip, doom scrolling on social media, TikTok, going out, trying to party, have fun, trying to find the next thing that will satisfy, because they remember they liked the last thing, but as soon as they were done, fun vanished. You see this in, I love sports. I, I like watching sports. I like football in particular. And you see a team do something incredible, work together the very best of their craft in a way that should glorify God. God made those bodies to do what they do. And frankly, it's incredible what the human body does on a football field. And they do it so well as a team, go through a regular season, the playoffs, and win the Super Bowl. And you see them exulting in the joy of, of the culmination of that season, the confetti coming down. What are you going to do? I'm going to Disneyland. And you can almost see it in their eyes. That's, that stunk. That was anticlimactic. Even as they're at the pinnacle, the, the highlight of their whole life, I've won the Super Bowl. Something that so few can say. And they're giving each other hugs and there's smiles. There's a shadow of, of maybe the fun that we might have if we're rightly related to the Lord that, that won't just evaporate, that isn't 
unsatisfying, isn't trivial. And as soon as they're done, all that they can think about is, how can I do that again? How can I do that again? And there's no satisfaction there. Ultimately, this world is trivial and it's passing away and our bodies are too. But the world that we were all once a part of believes that this world and these mortal bodies are all that truly matter, that the physical is ultimate. And they try to find satisfaction in the trivial. Turn to to Philippians 3.19. What I'm doing here is I'm laying out why it's not crazy for a Christian to ask. Is it okay to have fun? Philippians 3.19. We're going to be jumping all over today. Paul is speaking with tears of some he calls the enemies of the cross. And listen to what he describes them as. With tears, he says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. This doesn't mean that they live merely for food, but belly would be they, their God is fulfilling their wants. I want food. I want to eat. So I'm, I'm going to go after it with gluttony. I want pleasure. I'm going to pursue it with abandon. That is the God of all those who haven't submitted in faith to the Lord Jesus. Their God is just like these. Their their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame because their mind is set on earthly things. They live as if this earth is ultimate and try to seek ultimate pleasure in things here on this earth. And you see the transition, the the comparison in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from heaven, we await a savior, Jesus Christ, who's going to transform this lowly body that's breaking, that hurts, that if you've ever had, doesn't even have the capacity to sustain pleasure in the things that God has made. That's part of the fall. I'll I'll get there later. Uh, This lowly body is going to be transformed to be like his glorious one by the, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So it's not crazy for you to think, I, I used to worship this stuff. I used to worship the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of fun but I'm not a citizen of that world anymore. I'm not dead like that. For by grace I've been saved. Christ, God made me alive together with Christ. I'm not like the rest. And that's, that's a miracle. And then, then you think of like Jesus' statement about the rich man in, in Luke 12, 16, a parable. He told them a parable. It's 12, 16 through 21. You can just listen. Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. He had a plan so that he could enjoy himself. He had, he had worked hard so that he could accomplish a life of leisure, a life of joy, a life of fun. He'd worked hard so that this would be the end. Eat, drink, be merry. And then God said, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now... Who will own what you prepared? So is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. It's a fool's errand. It's an idiotic pursuit to try to live for this world and to find your joy and your satisfaction in things of this world. In this under the sun living like Solomon who 
who lived that, pursued those joys more than any of us ever will have the opportunity and came to the conclusion, it's vanity. You'll never find satisfaction and joy under the sun until you're rightly related to the Lord. We were made for ultimate things. Jeremiah Burroughs, there's a a quote I'm going to read, 17th century Puritan. Uh, If you read along the books of the month, you will have read this. Every month we, the elders, put forth a book for you. It's, It's usually quite short, something that you can easily read in a month, something that will care for your soul, something that you will increase in your knowledge of God, your godliness, your joy, your ability to live this life as a Christian if you read it. And the great thing is, if you read the book of the month, you read it together with a lot of people. Um, I'm so grateful for how many people read the book of the month. I would encourage you to do that. Um, This next month is particularly good. I think there's a a handout that you'll get in in the bulletin. But last month's book of the month, uh, written by Jeremiah Burroughs, this quote is from there. It says, you are made for eternity. And those created things were not. Therefore, if your hope is in this world only, you are a wretched creature. Oh, it is a dreadful thing for men or women to have their portion only in this world. Yet this is exactly what they have. Who have a great deal in this world, but don't know how to use it for God. But let me encourage you that a right response to the misuse of pleasure, the right response to a misuse of joy, a right response to the misuse of fun is not a rejection of it, but a proper alignment of it in relation to God. So again, if, if you are tempted to think the world and all the sinful people in the world pursue fun as if it's ultimate. Therefore, I must reject fun, pleasure, joy, and the things that God has made. That's not the biblical response to who you once were and this world is passing away. Instead, it's a proper alignment of fun in relationship to God. This is the point of Ecclesiastes, and it's, it's laid out in multiple other places throughout Scripture. Let's think about this. God's greatest gifts. You can go, just go to the next slide so they can see the definition of fun. God's greatest gifts are those that you and I, in our mixed condition, and the world in their unmixed sinful rejection of God, are most prone to abuse sinfully. God's greatest gifts, and every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God. Don't blame him when you sin, right? That's James 1, like 13 through, I should memorize it, 13 through 16-ish. God's greatest gifts are most prone to abuse. Sex, lust, food, gluttony, money, power, relationships, sleep, leisure, work. These are all good gifts from God, and we are prone to abuse them sinfully. It doesn't mean you reject the gift. Actually, we are warned against those who define religion, something that they say feels like godliness, but deny its power. It's like they get the shell but they miss the the actual body of, of what they're aiming at. Paul says it's because they aren't serving the living God, but we serve a living God. Go to Colossians 2.20. There's, there's two main warnings here, Colossians 2.20 and then 1 Timothy 4.1. I want to read both of them because I think they're an important warning against those who respond to the, the dangers of fun, the idolatry that your, your pleasures can offer by saying, now I shouldn't handle them, anything that might give me fun. I, I can't taste good food. I, I, I can't touch something that might 
might tempt me to uh, idolatry rather than, than actually sanctifying those desires. Colossians 2.20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit to decrees? Right, so we've died to this world. That's, that was what I said. We used to live for this stuff. So why would you submit to these things that say, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, which deal with everything destined to perish with use that are in accordance with the commands and teaching of men, which are matters having to be sure a wisdom in self-made religion, self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but there's no value against fleshly indulgence. Right, if, if the problem of our relationship to this stuff and fun is that we pursue it as ultimate, pursue it as idols, the problem is in our heart. We have to have our heart rightly related to stuff, our heart rightly related to God. And if you just say, all right, I'm not going to touch it, you didn't fix the problem. That's, that's what religion does. That's what every other religion does. Think about even, quote unquote, the some of the, the greatest perversions of Christian religion. Oh, Christian leaders, we're going to, don't let them marry. Go live up in the mountains in, in a monastery. Monks, don't, don't touch anything nice. Just eat, eat baked potatoes all day. Maybe don't even bake them. Eat them raw. You know, wake up early, go to bed late, do nothing but read, and maybe have a little garden. I, but don't do anything fun. Certainly, Certainly don't get married. That's self-made religion, self-abasement that puts power, puts justification, puts a hope for holiness in yourself instead of on Christ. Listen to 1 Timothy 4. That kind of thinking is actually described as demon doctrine. Demons love that doctrine. Don't have fun. Uh, if you would buy that, Satan would be happy. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. This, is, uh, this woos some who play around with the Christian faith, but don't actually put their faith in Christ. They pay attention to deceitful demons, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by the hypocrisy of liars who have seared in their own conscience, right? The kind of people who have whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones who are focused on outward forms, but neglect the heart. That's the kind of people who do this. Don't be this person. They forbid marriage. They advocate abstaining from foods, which God created to be shared in by Thanksgiving, uh, with Thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified, it's made holy by the word of God and prayer. What this doesn't mean is, okay, I can do all things sinful or not. If something is sinful, it cannot be holy. But that doesn't mean that things that God has made are explicitly sinful. No, God's made good things. And in his wisdom, he set up parameters by under which we can enjoy them. It, all, to say that something that God made is good does not mean that you pursue it as much as you can. God made food good. I'm going to eat as much as I can. God invented sex. I'm going to have as much of it as I can with whoever I want. That's not how it goes. God, in his wisdom, made good things and set up parameters. And violating those parameters, that was the first sin, right? God made a beautiful garden, good fruit, good food for his, his people and all his creatures to enjoy. But he said, not that one. But to say, because I can't eat the fruit from the tree that's in the midst of the garden. I shouldn't eat the fruit from any of the trees. No, God made those to be received with thanksgiving. 
we'll read, well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but those, we should receive God's gifts with thanksgiving. And if you can receive it with thanksgiving, that's a good sign that you're thinking of it in right relationship to the Lord. When you wake up and there's a beautiful sunset, or you go on a hike and you sort of enjoy the burn in your quads, or you, you play a good game with somebody and you're laughing, you enjoy music, the perfect harmony, the crescendos, decrescendos, and all that just gets you at, at your heart. God, God made those impulses. God made you like those things. And if you live for those things, saying, I want to worship music, hiking, athleticism, games, sports, relationships, coin collecting, whatever it is that you think is fun, you're going to miss the point. But if you receive those things as thanks, with thanksgiving in their proper weight, not distracting you from the mission that God has for you, but recognizing them and receiving them as gifts, looking at how do these relate to me? Is this an acceptable use of this? It's sanctified. It's made holy through the word of God. Looking at how does the word of God inform my use of this thing? And prayer, if you go through life with an awareness, all these good things I enjoy, they're not morally neutral. They're not just what I happen to come in contact with today. But when you're driving down the road and you see a beautiful sunset, you're playing with your kids and you giggle. You're like, where did that come from? Those are good gifts from God. Say thank you, Lord. Make them holy through prayer. That's something that unless you're rightly related to God as his child and him as your father, you can't do that. Charles Simeon once said late in his life, there are but two lessons for a Christian to learn. One is to enjoy God in everything. That doesn't mean God is in everything, but in whatever you do, enjoy God. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. That'll make life a lot more fun. And the other is to enjoy everything in God, meaning re receive everything, whether it's a trial or a blessing, as if it's come from the Lord. That, that's really what the end of James 5, or middle, James 5, when it's saying, it, is anybody suffering? Let them pray. Is anyone rejoicing? Let them sing praises. Whether something hard is coming to you or something that just brings your soul to rejoice, be defined by prayer. That will help you be rightly related to God in your fun. So now we get to finally the first point that was a, a prolonged introduction. But the, the first point is that God created fun as a gift. How do I know this? Well, well God created the world. Genesis 1.1. What's the constant refrain? God saw, God said it was, it was so. And then God saw that it was good. You see it in 114, 110, 112, 118, 121, 126, or 125. And now look at 126, Genesis 126. God, then God made man, and he gave him dominion over the animals. He created male and female marriage union and all that comes with that. We see in chapter two, he gave, gave him actually work to do that wasn't going to be futile. And then it says in 126, he gave him every green plant for food. And behold, it was very good. God made the world and he made us with all of our capacity for enjoyment, our capacity for work. And, and our capacity for fun. That's just one of those things. Fun didn't happen as a distortion of creation. I believe it was there. Enjoyment of God's gifts was there. Actually in an untainted form before the fall. It's interesting when he gave him every green plant for food. And, and you see in chapter 3 when they're tempted. Say, oh, I, I want that. 
there's something pleasurable. They, Adam and Eve are associating eating with pleasure. God created food not merely for nourishment. He didn't say, I'm going to put them in the garden and I don't like potatoes, so I'm just going to keep going back. And I'm going to give them a potato to eat. I just think they're, I don't get it. They're bland, they're gross, but it's, I, and God, get, God made some of you guys enjoy potatoes. That's cool. Um, but like God made curry. He made peppers. He made jalapenos. He made fruits. He made coffee. <laughs> think about that. That's not after the fall kind of stuff. He even used sin. Like think about that. He, if God accomplishes good through sin, the fall happened, sin happened, because before it was all vegetables. And then there's meat. God, God used the fall to make steak. Like he is, and we can be right, when we understand we're rightly related to him, we can say, thank you, God. What joy. God made food, not merely for nourishment. And God made companionship, marriage, marital relations. He made work and the joys that come with it. I made something. I troubleshot it. It, it works. He, you know that's fun, right? When you have a project and it, it, it's just, it's not going right. And it's not going to go right always. That's not part of the fall. That's just part of limitations. Futility, right? Toil, that's part of the fall. But just, I'm working at it. I'm, and then it's just perfect. That's fun. There's joy there. God made us like that. And he put man in the garden to tend it. He gave him dominion over the earth. He gave them food that tastes good and companionship that was sweet. God made fun, and he made the capacity for fun. And God made us in his image. There's a lot. This is something I wish that the Bible talked more about. But you see some, some evidences that God takes pleasure in what he made, right? Just when he says, he looks at it and goes, that's good. Oh, that's really good. And like you read something like Psalm 104, 31, where it says, let the glory of Yahweh endure forever. Let Yahweh be glad in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. You could just imagine God like setting off, setting off volcanoes and be like, yeah, that's cool. I did that. And then there's, you think of like all of I scuba dive and you're down there and you're looking at fish and coral and you're like, God, you made this and nobody until like the last 70 years, I mean, 80 years has ever seen it. And there's stuff that we don't even know about. God did that. And God sort of hints at that when he's rebuking Job. He's like, yeah, Job, you're going to tell me I, how, what happens out on the mountains? Who made the storms? Who made the, who sent the snow? And how does that happen? Job, you want to, you want to tell me how I should have done this creation? And he, he sort of brags on his creation a little bit. I think he takes joy in it. We, we mimic God in that way. Um, when we take joy in what we make. But as we see God rejoicing, being glad in his works, at Psalm 104, it goes on to say, I will sing. Let Yahweh be glad in his works. And then he says, and I will sing to Yahweh throughout my life. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let my musing be pleasing to him. As for me, I'll be glad in Yahweh. God's created the capacity in us for enjoyment, uh, pleasure, and fun in the world and the stuff that he made, not to distract us from joy in him, but to drive us to him with thanksgiving and worship. God created not only the things that we enjoy, but he created the capacity in us to enjoy him and his creation. Think about it. Is there, how much of the stuff do you, that you do in the day just isn't there's no real pleasure in it. Like your heart beats and it just happens in the background. You breathe and it, it isn't particularly pleasurable. It, it is if you have had to hold your breath for a long time, right? Or, or you're breathing bad air and you finally get a, a, a breath of good, of fresh air. God could have done everything like that. God created taste buds. Do you know how much of your brain is devoted 
Like you have a whole cranial nerve to like your olfactory nerve and your tongue and all these taste buds that like all these crazy chemoreceptors on there that are designed by God to taste chemicals, not merely in an informative way. Oh, that tastes like poison. You probably shouldn't eat it. That, that tastes like food. Go ahead. But you taste it and you actually are like, oh, that tastes good. That, that tastes really good. God made your taste buds. God made your olfactory bulb, your olfactory nerve, your ability for you to smell. God made your eyes not merely to inform you of the world around you, but to give you joy as you look at the painting of the, that he did with the sunset behind the, the beautiful mountains that he created. When you look out at the ocean, you see a rainbow you see your kids, your wife, any number of, of beautiful things. God created the capacity to enjoy him. He created our hearts to long for things greater than us. Like he created us. One of my favorite memories is, is my son, Andrew. We were driving up to the Grand Canyon. If you guys know him, you know he wears his joy on his face. He was probably three and we're driving up to the Grand Canyon. And you know how it looks just like a flat plane. You have no idea it's there. And the next thing you know, there's this gorgeous hole in the ground. It was fun. We'd come around the corner and we'd catch a glimpse and he's just, oh! and he's so joyful. He is shaking as he sees it. And then we cross around and he, he misses it. And I was like that almost like the first time I saw it. And then we come back around and we see the hole in the ground again. And, oh! He does it again. And we, we miss it. And he, all day long, all day long. And I, I like, I got excited about it about three times. And then, and then I, I don't know, I got distracted by, by lesser things. I think that's part of the fall is our, our capacity to enjoy things has been diminished, right? We have like the neuthetic effects of sin on our, our, our brain, our ability to, to, to know rightly. I, I don't know what you call it. it I don't, I'm not going to make up a word right now, but there's an effect of sin, I think, on our, our affections, our capacity for joy. I, I get distracted easy. But I, I think we get glimmers of what we were created for and what we will be when our mortal bodies are, are cast off, when we are at the Father's right hand where there's pleasures forevermore. We don't get tired of the hole in the ground after three times, but we see his glory in what he's made and, and we enjoy it rightly because we're rightly related to him. Even the sinful world that rejects God gets a glimpse of that. They see it, they like it. But when they're done, they, they're like, I, I want to do that again rather than being, they, they live for the, the hit. They live for the moment rather than um, being able to look at that and just worship the Lord and use that to look forward to um, a new heavens, new earth, where those things will be restored and we will in, in greater glory, greater pleasure, and we will be uh, untainted by sin in our enjoyment of them. I got distracted. God created the capacity in us to enjoy him. So if you guys ever eat with me, I shepherd my heart daily in this. When I thank God for food, when I pray, it's rare that I don't say, God, thank you for taste buds. And when I'm driving into work, I shepherd my heart to say, God, thank you for these eyes. Thank you for creating colors. He didn't need to make wavelengths look like colors to us and didn't need to create in us a brain that perceives the beauty in that. The math behind music and sound waves and the fact that he gave us these remarkable sound sensors. And not only are they receive sound, but, but they're not like a dummy speaker. They're connected to a supercomputer that takes that signal, receives it, can pull out voices and then appreciate music and find pleasure in like the tweeting of birds and the rumble of the, of the ocean. God did that. 
God did that. So when you get the ability to enjoy those things, right? You don't live to find it. You're not looking for your next hit. We're satisfied. We're content if we have nothing. If God's lot for us is to lock us up in a prison with a drab wall and we live there until we die, that can, we can say, okay, I can take joy in that. God's accomplishing his perfect will in my life and it's not my lot to have fun or at least not as much fun as everybody else has. Although you see Paul and Silas, they made the best of their prison experience. They were singing and worshiping even while they were uncomfortable. We can too. But you might say, I'm not having as much fun as maybe I could. That's okay. Um, this life is really, really short. In like 100,000 years, you won't miss it. But you don't look at 100,000 years from now and say, oh, I'm going to have so much more joy then because I'm going to be rightly related to my, my Lord. I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to be like him because I see him as he is. I'm, it's just going to be a better world. So I better not have fun now. No, that's, that's not right. God gives us these good gifts to enjoy. It says in, oh, I'll just say that. Flip to 1 Timothy 6, 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17. We will spend a lot of time here next week. But I just want you to see God's purpose in supplying things to the rich. 1 Timothy 6, 17. He says, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. But what does God do for the rich who are in him? He richly provides us with everything to enjoy. God has a purpose in giving the rich their stuff. Now, if the rich set their hopes in those things, if the rich love money, that's a pathway to really eternal destruction, damnation, and, and not being able to enjoy those things that God richly provides. But to the rich, he provides them with everything, with what purpose? To enjoy. So the rich who is rightly related to God, enjoying those things provided by God as a gift, what do they do? Do good. Be rich in good works. Imit imitate your father who says, I have a lot of stuff. I'm going to give some of it to my kids. Um, God knows what you need. If you ask for it, he, he won't withhold any good thing from his children. It's interesting when you look at the Bible. There's very few examples of suffering pulling people away from God. There's lots of examples of stuff, riches, pulling people away from God. So if God gives you stuff, be careful. Don't worship it. Don't enjoy it as a substitute for God, but receive it as a gift from God to be enjoyed. And then with that stuff, do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous and ready to share. You're not like, that's my stuff that God gave me for my joy. You don't get any of it. No, God this wasn't mine. God gave it to me. I'm going to enjoy it. You want to enjoy it too? Um, that's the way that we relate to our stuff and our fun, rightly. Ecclesiastes simply declares that wealth and possessions and the power to enjoy those things is a gift from God, right? So I'm, I'm arguing that God created fun and God created the capacity to enjoy him and his creation and listen, listen to Solomon. He says, behold, this is Ecclesiastes 5.18. He says, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink, find enjoyment in all the toil in which one toils under the sun. Don't find satisfaction in there. Don't pursue that as ultimate. You, you know the end of the book, fear the Lord. But for the one who fears him, while you're here in this life under the sun, Eat, drink, find enjoyment in the toil in which one toils under the sun. You don't actually honor God better 
when you only eat potatoes and you only drink water and you sort of grumble and just do your work because you got to. You glorify God if you, if you enjoy what you eat, enjoy what you drink, and have fun while you work. Here's why. These are the days of your life that God has given him. This is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and the power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is a gift from God. Do you get it? Enjoying those things is actually a gift from God. And it's remarkable that the characteristic of the world that's trying to live for joy of those things, if you hang around the water cooler or whatever you do at work, what's the, what's the dominating characteristic of those people, of the world? Grumbling, <laughs> right? Like, oh, the weather stinks. Oh, I'm hungover. Oh, I did, my team didn't win. Oh, whatever, right? Like, they're just, they're, there's the, <laughs> you might get glimpses of, that was so much fun. Oh, but now it's Monday, right? Like they they almost have to throw in life stinks on top of I'm enjoying it. Christians don't be like that. Enjoy what you eat. Enjoy what you drink. Enjoy the toil that you have because it's, if you can do that, it's a gift from God. So when you wake up in the morning and you say, God, thank you for sustaining me during the night and letting me wake up this morning, follow that up with, God, will you give me the capacity to enjoy the good things that you give me today? And will you give me the endurance uh, that, that will sustain me through the trials? We don't live for the fun. We don't live for the joy. But when God gives it, enjoy it. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 10. Go, eat, br- eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking for your head. Enjoy life. This is Smed's favorite verse, and it's one of my top five as well. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he's given you under the sun, because that's your portion in life and your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you're going. Basically, God gave you this life and he gave you these things to do. It's only going to last as long as your life. So eat your food with happiness. Put on clean clothes and go outside with a smile. This is my shorthand of, or my summary of, of these verses. Put on clean clothes. Go outside with a smile. Enjoy the world around you. Enjoy life with your wife. And in the work that you have to do, take joy in it. These things, even in a sin-tainted world, do not have to be rejected as sinful. All these things that he listed were created before sin entered the world. And it's possible to enjoy them in an idolatrous way, but it's not automatically idolatrous to enjoy them. Indeed, it's commanded It's obedience to enjoy them. It doesn't honor God to eat your potatoes with a frown or to wear frumpy clothes, to be unkept, to not enjoy your wife and her beauty and pleasures, and to view your work merely as necessary toil. It doesn't honor God. And everyone, in one sense, can enjoy this stuff but we who know God are the only ones who can enjoy them as gifts from God with thanksgiving, sanctifying them with the word of God and prayer. So last point of today, of point one of three, and we'll get to the next two next week. Um, God created fun with a purpose, right? God created the world and the things that we enjoy. God created the capacity to enjoy him And then God created fun with a purpose. Fun was never intended to be ultimate or ultimately satisfying before the fall or after. It was never intended to be ultimate. Um, I'm going to, I can't say it better than Piper, so I'm just going to 
read it with you. This is from Living in the Light, Money, Sex, and Power, Making the Most of Three Dangerous Opportunities. Amazing book that I highly commend to you. He says, all of creation was meant to communicate the supreme beauty and worth of God. God created the world for his glory. He created the world so that he would be magnified by the way his, cre his creatures find their greatest satisfaction in him. Money, sex, power, and really anything that you can enjoy of God's gifts ultimately exist to show that God is more desired than those things. That is paradoxically how they become most satisfying in themselves. Do you get it? You, you actually f have more fun when you find more joy and ultimate satisfaction in God, the giver of these things, than the, the fun that you're enjoying. Satisfaction and ultimate joy are to be found in God alone. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Don't get that backwards. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That doesn't mean that you don't enjoy these other things because your pleasure is only in God, but actually your pleasure in God is magnified as when you enjoy his gifts as gifts. As you enjoy them, you say, these are not my ultimate treasure and satisfaction, but you enjoy God as he gives you those gifts. Fun points us to the giver of the fun. While Paul was preaching the gospel to the idolatrous in Lystra and pleading with them to worship God and not Paul and Silas, right? They healed the, the person who was uh, lame from, from birth and, and they tried to sacrifice to him. And Acts 14, 15, here's what Paul says, pleads with them. He says, men, why are you doing these things? We're men the same nature as you. We're proclaiming the gospel that you should turn from these vain things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, right? They were idol worshipers, worshiping gods of pleasure, gods of stuff. And then Paul says, in generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their way. And yet he did not leave himself without a witness. What was the witness that God left that Paul points to here? He says, in that he did good, he gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, and he filled your heart with food and gladness. The fact that the world can enjoy common grace, and there is some sense of enjoyment, even if it's not ultimate, they can't find ultimate satisfaction. We'll, we'll get to that next week on, on the, the vanity of the world's pursuit. But the fact that they, they can have gladness and, and full hearts and, and God's common grace. God's purpose in doing that was to give them testimony of God. It's like first Timothy six seventeen says, God provides us with everything to enjoy. So be thankful. Be thankful. Go out with eyes to see the common joys in life. Not, eyes to, not a, a heart that wants to pursue these common joys in life, but go out with eyes to see that joys in life are from the Lord. And not only the things that you enjoy, but the capacity to enjoy them. Your taste buds, your eyes, your ears, your very pleasure sense, the, the dopamine in your substantia nigra that gives you that joy feeling. God, God wired you like this with a purpose. Sin has corrupted it. That's next week. So we're going to start with, right, God created fun. Point two is sin corrupted the relationship with fun. 
point three will be only Christians can truly have fun. But now we're up at God created this. So receive it with thanksgiving. If you can receive it without sinning, do so. Sanctify it. Make it holy by saying, how, how does this joy relate to, to God? What, what does this reveal about God? What does God tell me about this thing that I'm enjoying? And pray for it. Let's pray. God, thank you for these bodies that you've made. Thank you for this world that you've created. Thank you for this universe with cool things that maybe we'll find out about someday. And, and maybe our, you're the only one who takes joy in those things for now. But God, you are so gracious to put us in a world filled with good things and giving us the ability to enjoy them. And God, we were born in rebellion to you. We were dead, and we, we, uh, we really worshipped those things. We exchanged the creator and creator worship for worship of the creatures, worship of the created things, and we deserved judgment. But you, being rich in mercy with which you loved us, you made us alive together with Christ and you changed us from the heart so that we don't live for ourselves any longer. We don't live for this world and its fleeting pleasures. We live for you. Our joy is in you. And now, because our joy is in you and our joy is not in these things, now we can truly enjoy these things as gifts from you now that we are rightly related to you. God, I pray for wisdom. I pray that you would guard us from idolatry, that you would guard us from love of this world. But as we live in this world with its good gifts, I pray we would recognize them for what they are, good gifts from you to enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.